what we saw from Jonas and especially the way he looks, uh, it's going to be difficult to shake him off, but he will try, especially because then it's until the next time trial and then until stage 14. So I think tomorrow we will see another massive multiple attacks from Pogacar. Uh, if he goes, Jonas probably will be able to be followed. Nobody else will, will be able to follow. Nobody. There's nobody who can follow those guys. Wow. And even though it's a more gradual approach, it's oh. gonna, it, they're going to be that far ahead of any, anybody. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's only two riders in, in, in today's peloton who can, who can produce seven watts per kilo for more than 20 minutes. And that's Jonas and today. Hello and welcome to JB Squared. This is your additional coverage for the move where Johan Bernil goes very, very deep on some other details that we don't always get to on the move. Uh, and I'm JB Hager joining him. You guys name the show JB Squared. Uh, we're going to be really happy to jump into uh, stage three, which was a historical day. If you didn't watch it, we'll give you the details on that. And tomorrow's going to be really big. Uh, but first, thank you to our title sponsor, JB Squared, for this tour. And that is Ketone. IQ. We're all on the ketones and it's driving us through, you know, putting out four shows a day. It keeps your energy going. Trust me. Uh, if you want to give it a try, I re highly recommend uh, doing a subscription. Try it for three to six months and you'll feel a difference physically, mentally, and much, much more. 30% uh, off your first subscription order in a free six pack when you use the link ketone.com slash the move. All right. First, Johan, let's jump into why it was a historical day. It almost feels a little bit like deja vu because we had this same conversation when uh, Binyam, Binyam Girme won a stage at the Giro. That was a historical day. When he won Ghent Wevelgem, that was a historical day. And Tour de France, the big Mac Daddy of them all, if, uh, which is, I know you would say that, another historical day. Yes, JB, it was a historical day today. Um, Binyam Girmay wins the stage in the Tour de France, his first ever Tour de France stage win. Already won a stage in the Giro in the past, one Gant Wevelgem, as you said. But, you know, it's nice to see him back uh, after last year, at least struggling quite a bit to get back to his usual level that we, we, we know him from. He had a few crashes in the Spring Classics. Uh, and so... Um, to see him back and but man what a what a surprise victory uh this was a real bunch sprint although you know there were crashes and some of the sprinters mainly Jasper Philipson was not there but a lot of others were there Dali was there Gaviria was there um what's his name um Pedersen, Pedersen was there uh the, what's the guy from from uh, the, the Dutch champion, uh, Grunewagen, Grunewagen was there. <laughs> um, so, you know, a lot of top sprinters and, and considering that Girmay is not really a pure sprinter, like for example, I mean, he was not in any of the top three predictions. Uh, he, he usually, I, he usually does well with kind of an uphill punchy finish. He does, he does, and also he does well when it's chaos. And it was yeah. chaos today because there was not, you know, the strong dominant lead out train of Alpecin that everybody was counting mm -hmm. on. As a matter of fact, if you look back uh, in the last kilometer, uh, his team, um, Intermarché, uh, was leading it out. They had the three first riders in the last corner, but not Girmay. Girmay was like in 10th or 12th position, and they were leading it out for their sprinter of the day, who was Gerben Thijssen, the, the, the Belgian guy. They were way too early. Yeah, I, you could see right. them looking back. They were yeah. trying trying to figure out. They they yeah, felt, they were I way too felt... early, but Girmay was not part of that train, and he right. was kind of finding the wheels. And all of a sudden, it kind of slows down a bit. He comes on the side, gets almost closed in, but finds a way. And and you know he has this incredible acceleration. Uh, to me, it's it's actually quite surprising to see. I mean, uh, I've already studied this guy. I mean, he does not look like a sprinter. He, he's not massive. He doesn't have huge muscular legs, mm -hmm. but yet he has this punch, this acceleration that is, is so unique. Uh, and to see him win this stage against uh, Gaviria, against Arnaud Lee, against Pedersen, uh, I mean, that's quite, quite the sprint victory. And then on top of that, you know, being the first black African 
uh, rider to to win a stage in the Tour de France. It's, it's historic. Uh, he's not the first African rider. Uh, I think there's three or four more, but the first African cyclist to win a stage in the Tour de France was a, a guy from Algeria called uh, Marcel Molines in 1950. Mm. Quite a bit, quite a while ago. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. You know, it's a huge, huge win for Africa. The whole continent is behind him. And, you know, he already was a hero in his country, but this will like magnify. I mean, you you can see always, there's a big Eritrean community in Europe. I'm always surprised to see this, like a lot of Eritrean people at the races. But imagine what this is going to be in his home country. This is going to be crazy. Yeah, I think this is important to revisit because we did talk about cycling in Eritrea, but that was a couple of years ago. We yeah. have a lot of new listeners. I think it's worth revisiting. The cycling scene there is is rabbit. They're going crazy. And I think yeah. you said that Ineos has a development program there. They're, they're expecting, everyone's expecting more and more and more talent to come out of yeah. it that yeah. part of the yeah, country. You no, know, it, 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 there's been already quite a few Eritrean riders in the tour. Um, I think, uh, I mean, all, the, all of this comes actually, these, all, most of these riders come through the, uh, there's, there's a special program at the UCI, at the, at the cycling, the, the World Cycling Center that kind of takes care of r- talent from non-traditional cycling countries. And so there was there was a time, and I think I don't know if they still have it, but you know the late uh, Hein Verbruggen, who was UCI president many years ago, started this initiative to 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 set up uh, the UCI team composed of riders of non traditional cycling mm-hmm. countries, lots of Africans, uh, and so. Uh, I remember one of the first riders was uh, from Eritrea. Was called uh, was a rider called Daniel Tekla Heimanot, who was uh, at the tour. Um, I even think, if I remember correctly, that at one or a few days he wore the polka dot jersey at the Tour de France, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so, yeah, Binyam Girmay is a continuation of this. But you know, there's I, I, I suspect there's a lot of other talents in the waiting room, and this will only enhance the popularity of cycling and and motivate a lot of young African athletes to to start cycling and and you know they look up to a guy like that and they say okay hey I can do this too and uh correct me if I'm wrong they don't do champagne daily at the uh at the podium for the tour you know what? I have not. I have not <laughs> paid attention to that, but I was kind of worried because we all know what happened. <laughs> Binyam Girmay a few years ago at the Giro, he won the stage, amazing, super, super celebration, and then on the podium he uncorked the the champagne bottle, and the the cork went into his eye, and he had to abandon the race the day after. So he had to go, he had to, go to the hospital too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, even, listen. I mean, I think even if they give champagne, there's. I don't think there's any rule that can force you to open that bottle. And <laughs> I'm pretty sure that he pays carefully attention now to, to that whenever he, uh, whenever he wins a race. But uh, yeah, I mean, what a day, you know, and it's, also if you saw the interview after the stage, he was so emotional. It was like, it was, I mean, it means a lot. I mean, it means a lot for any rider to win a stage at the tour, but for him, this is, this is, this is unbelievable actually. Yeah, he's. Uh, uh, I think he's probably the candidate to be the next president of Eritrea. <laughs> he's a rock star. Yeah, that's for sure. And then maybe we'll see another win from him if he's on this good of form. Um, as you mentioned, he was up against a lot of the big, big sprinters, but that that was it. Went from eight wide teams across the entire road after those couple of those 90 degree turns and a couple of roundabouts to a very small bunch, which probably favors Girmay too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously we, we have to, you know, acknowledge the fact that there were some crashes. Um, it, it is, I mean, almost to be, to be expected, you know, it was a 230 kilometer stage. Nothing happened. Absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing. The guys that went in the front was just because basically because they wanted to be on TV. They know they knew they were not going anywhere. And so you could really start to feel the buildup of the stress and the nerves in the last 15 kilometers. Um, 
it was a slow, I mean, uh, I mean, slow, uh, you know, relatively slow, uh, but you know, for professional cycling and for, for the tour in the wheels, it was an easy stage. Um, but then you get fresh riders at the finish and everybody wants to fight for position. Nobody wants to lose time. So you have this nerves building up the last 15 kilometers. You know, if you look, if you see what it looks like and you know what it feels like to be there, it was war. All the teams with the GC guys bringing their guys to the front until, you know, usually it's then it's three kilometers today. Today was different. They did an experiment and the, the UCI has announced that they're going to do some tests to change the three kilometer rule, potentially to a five kilometer rule. Whenever there's a situation in the future, uh, if they come into a big city and, you know, the, the it, you get into lots of corners and road furniture with more than 5k to go that they will in the future uh, uh, you know, allow a five kilometer rule. It but, will be, but depending on, on the course, it will be based on the situation. Okay. But today there was a, there was a test, not a very good test because they crashed, but I, I had nothing to do with the three or the five kilometer rule. It was just because it was so fast and everybody was still fresh. Were the uh, GC guys out of the way by the time that crash happened? I w- well, um, for the most part, uh, no. Yeah, for the most part, with the big crash was with two and a half yeah. kilometers to go. So it, whatever it was, if it was 5K or three kilometer rule, the danger was gone. But, you know, the three kilometer rule, JB, I mean, people start sometimes forget, you know, it, it it's not a free pass. You know, it's it's only an issue when when there's a crash or a mechanical. Let's say if, the, if you pass the three kilometers and there's a gap in the peloton mm-hmm. without any incident, you lose that time. Mm-hmm. It's only mm-hmm. when there's a crash and you are behind the crash. That's a good point. I think the general perception is that those GC, GC guys can completely sit up and no, so, soft pedal in. No, 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 <clears throat> no, no yeah. never, never, never. Uh, when the, if there's a gap, there's a gap. Uh, it needs to be because of a mechanical or a crash. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there was this crash um, already before that with 6K to go. We had the first, we had a mechanical from Mathieu van der Poel. So obviously... That was a big blow for Philipson. There, they got a little bit, you know, derailed their their train. And then on top of that, I think Philipson was also in that crash with two and a half kilometers to go, either in the crash or behind the crash, mm-hmm. like some other riders. <clears throat> and is that what so, happened? To, was Cavendish behind that as well? He was behind the crash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so obviously a different, completely different sprint. And there was there was not many many riders left uh, in those last two turns, which you know was obviously uh, great for the guys who were up there. I mean, the only rider who was also up there with a, a teammate uh, uh, who normally would not be there was was Richard Carapaz because he was one of the three riders that potentially could take over yellow from Tadej Pogacar because he was in the same time. So uh, if, he, if they knew already on beforehand that Pogacar yesterday tried to give away the jersey, and today was an ideal opportunity because if you have four riders in the same time, then it's the uh, the accumulation of the placings. Uh, so if Pogaccia, for example, would come in 50th or 60th uh, and Carapaz was top 20, then he would take the jersey. Mm-hmm. Um, he still needed to be in front of Evenepoel and, and Jonas, but both of those guys were also behind the crash. So the only guy who was, the only guy of the four who was in the first group was uh, was Carapaz, and so you could clearly see that that was a goal of EF. They were, they kept him up there on purpose. He was fighting, fighting for position uh, because you know that uh, as a GC guy, once you get into that bubble in the last kilometer, then you can stay there. Mm-hmm. You can stay there uh, because the you know everybody else is already gone or you know they lost a lot of places. So that was a goal for them and. Um, and yeah, I mean, Carapaz got yellow, uh, which which I think for him and for the team is is an amazing performance. Uh, you know, Carapaz, first time that he gets the yellow jersey in the Tour de France. He has now won, uh, now worn the leader's jersey in uh, in all three Grand Tours. Mm-hmm. You know, he won the Giro. He had the, the red jersey in the Vuelta and now he has the yellow jersey in, in the Tour. So that's quite an accomplishment, I would say. Um, also first time in the history of EF, if I'm not mistaken, that they have the yellow jersey. So obviously that was a huge goal for them. 
Uh, and on top of that, I think a great uh, situation for UAE because uh, they don't have the jersey tomorrow. And get um, some help. A, a lot of help. Yeah. A lot of help. I mean, if 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 they're to, if they're in tomorrow in the jersey, they have to pull the whole day, and and they will burn three guys that now in theory they can keep fresh for the lower slopes of of the Gali Gate tomorrow. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think a great day for Carapaz and, uh, quite, quite the statement. Um, it looks to me like he's going to be doing a really good tour. He might find some extra motivation, you know, with this situation. This is, this is huge. Something else that's really interesting, uh, to me, and I'd love for you to expand on this. Here we are with four smaller teams that we've talked about. You know, it was DSM wins the day one, Arkea day two, Inter, now Intermarche, uh, and EF is in yellow. This is an unusual beginning to a tour. It, it is. I mean, first of all, the first two, the first two was, uh, was, was very special. And on top of that, two French riders. Um, so that was, that was quite the thing. But now uh, Girmay, a uh, low-budget team, um, I think also their first, I would when I would want to say their first win, their first stage win in the in the history of the of the, of of the team in the tour. Mm-hmm. If I'm not mistaken, I could be mistaken, but I, I think it's their first stage win. Um, so so yeah, I mean, quite uh, uh, you know an unusual situation. Uh, I would say in in times that cycling is dominated by big budget teams, and mm-hmm. basically these teams, you know, take the lion's share of all the wins. Uh, it's nice to see. It's nice to see that um, you know it's possible that uh, a smaller team can can get success also in the Tour de France. Now let's look ahead to tomorrow. This is a much anticipated stage, and it's y- y- both you and George are t- a little taken aback about how they're going into the high mountains f- for a day and then out. This is a very and to go to such a big climb stage four this is mm-hmm. this is not the normal well i mean it obviously has to do also geographically where where the where the race starts in italy they have to come out of italy go to france so they usually uh, typically they have to go to, through the alps right so <laughs> right. so uh I'm, I'm a bit i mean obviously it, i think it's on purpose because you know you can't have several alp stages in the first week that would be that would the, the design of the tour would not be smart that way. So sprinters they, would not be wanting to go. Well, I mean, and also, also, you know, it, the 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 GC would be set straight away, yeah. which is not in the interest of 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 the of the whole event, right? So, but tomorrow stage, I mean, it's 140 kilometers. Start in Pinerolo, finish in Valoir, but they do three big climbs. They do Sestriere and Mont Genevre and uh, Galibier, especially the Galibier, very. Uh, a high climb, uh, 2,642 meters of altitude. It's the second highest climb uh, of the tour. And, um, you know, it is from the easier side, which uh, which is kind of, uh, you know, better, I think, for the race. But still, the last eight kilometers are, uh, you know, seven and a half, eight percent. Why do you say it's better to, to keep things together a bit? Exactly. Yeah. It's not, yeah. it's, it, you know, it's, it, people are going to lose time and it, it, it won't be a decisive stage. Mm-hmm. You know, some guys are not going to be able to follow the, the 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 main guys, but I think it will stay within certain limits. And also, especially, it's not a mountain top finish; it's still 19 kilometers downhill to Valois, um, which, for people who are watching cycling, uh, usually the downhill we will see tomorrow is the downhill that Tom Kit Pitcock took so spectacularly when he won the stage to Alp d'Huez. Uh, a few years ago, uh, he went over the top of the Galibier and then threw himself like a stone. Down oh, there, the yeah, there's a, a famous clip of him passing on the outside through a turn. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, that's the downhill. Uh, yeah. Different difference is that back then the Galibier came early in the stage. Now it's at the end of the stage and will be decided between, you know, the main climbers. Um, so. I think it's it's definitely GC day tomorrow, and um, as I said, you know, for for UAE and even for Visma, uh, great great situation because I, th- I think EF will control the whole stage with the hope 
uh, and the confidence that Carapaz can uh, stay with these guys or in, in, in the other case, lose a bit of time and maybe make it back uh, in the downhill and, and hang on to yellow. That would be a huge objective for them, I think. So uh, I expect uh, big fireworks tomorrow, from, from mainly from Pogacar. Uh, I think he will have to try again. Uh, you know, he already tested, or the team tested Jonas Vingegaard on stage one. He tested Jonas yesterday on stage two, shorter climb. Tomorrow, hard climb, longer altitude. Third big test, uh, third exam for Jonas Vingegaard. But I mean, how's this going to play out? We're going to obviously see EF trying to pull and control it as long as they can. Then you've got like, Adam Yates is in great shape. Yeah. You know, close numbers, but not Pogacar or Vingago numbers. Well, it also, uh, Jorg- it always, Jorgensen's right there too. Yeah. It always depends, JB, whether, you know, uh, it, it's always different race if the stage win is up for grabs between the big favorites or if the stage win is gone already because of a breakaway. So in the case of EF, uh, I would say if, if, I, if I would – you know, decide on a strategy, which I'm not, but, and, and, and even less for EF, we all know that it's not my favorite team because of who's the manager of the team. But anyway, that's a different, <laughs> different topic. We will leave that out of the discussion here. We'll do a whole uh, separate podcast for that one. Uh, not even, I don't, <laughs> I don't think, I don't think it's worth, you know, anyways, uh, I think it would be in their interest that, uh, the stage win is gone because of a breakaway, because that kind of demotivates mm. a bit the favorites, you know, because uh, there's no stage win. Um, so that would be my preferred tactic. Like let us, let the group go, mm. uh, make sure that the, the Jersey keeps, uh, stays within reach, but, but not the stage win. Uh, but anyway, independently, whether it's a stage win or not, Pogacar will attack. He will attack. It's uh, it's eight kilometers, seven and a half percent. So I would expect uh, probably an effort of twenty to twenty-five minutes uh, at altitude. Uh, it's a different type of effort <laughs> than than what we've seen until now. So, mm-hmm. as I said, you know, going off what we saw from Jonas and especially the way he looks, uh, it's going to be difficult to shake him off. But he will try especially because then it's until the next time trial and then until stage 14. So I think tomorrow we will see another massive multiple attacks from Pogacar. Uh, if he goes, Jonas probably will be able to be followed. Nobody else will, will be able to follow. Nobody. There's nobody who can follow those guys. Wow. Even though it's a more gradual approach, it's oh. going it, to, they're going to be that far ahead of anybody. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's only two riders in, in, in today's Peloton who can, who can produce seven watts per kilo for more than 20 minutes. And that's Jonas and today. Everybody else is, you know, a little bit less, you know, 6.7, 6.8. Uh, that's their maximum. And, you know, it's, it's amazing, but it's not good enough to follow those guys. I'm really looking forward to outcomes too, uh, in you and Spencer to, to figure this one out, but, but it, cause you, you're going to probably have some wild cards for that breakaway. I'm guessing. Well, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, and, and also, you know, if you, if you're in a breakaway, you need to be a good climber to win that stage. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter who's in there. I mean, if you can't climb, you still have to go over the eight kilometers on the Galibier and, you know, it, it's considered the easy, easy side, but it's hard. Yeah. Uh, one more quick thing. I, we don't want to go too long today. I have a couple of questions for you, but we had talked a couple of days ago about the, the Visma, uh, Lisa by control center. Mm-hmm. And then yesterday, I think you sent a note to everybody. It's like, up oh, you see, I did not permit it. They didn't ban it. Well, it's not, it's not the use this time. It's not the UCI it's ASO, ASO. but okay. it's, it's, that, it doesn't really matter. You know, that's, it's always, okay. We have the power and you guys need to, you know, but do whatever we tell you to do. So it is, you know, the, it's not the, so anyway, for listeners who haven't been following this, so Visma came with, um, 
an announcement that they have uh, a van, a very futuristic van with all the potential devices, all the information combined in the same van. And they have specialists and analysts in there to, you know, get information and rely that information to the team car during the race, um, you know, compared to somebody having to call from an office or whatever. I mean, it doesn't really, it's really the same thing, but uh, anyways, this van was presented and then the UCI came, okay, we need to investigate this if this is not infringing the UCI regulations because there are certain rules that prohibit passing data from rider to car or from car to rider. Uh, for example, you can't transmit the power output from a rider mm. to the car. If that's real time data to the car. Real time data. Yeah. They can all, they can uh, look at it after the race all they exactly, want. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. So, so, you know, I mean, I, I, that's not the purpose of this van anyway. It doesn't mm. matter. It's not the purpose of this van because this van is not in a race. It's either at the hotel or you know, somewhere. It could you know? be anywhere. It's no different exactly. than a, it, it a group could be in of... a different country. It doesn't really matter. Uh, or it could know? be a, a hotel room doing the exactly. same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so now uh, ASO has decided that uh, this van does not get a credential. Like, you know, you, you have a lot of vehicles in the tour and usually so the you have two race vehicles, two race cars. Uh, these guys get a credential, then the bus, then the truck. And then a few support vans that will go from start to feed zones or, you know, they, anyway, this van does not get an ASO sticker because <laughs> there's different, you know, possibilities. You can say, okay, because you didn't ask us, mm. you didn't come with your idea to us on beforehand. So now we don't like it. Uh, or you could say, oh, okay, you know, everybody needs to have access to the same possibilities uh you know they're all about okay you know this is a disadvantage for the smaller teams i mean i remember jb uh long time ago don't remember how many years ago but it's second third or fourth tour de france we did with postal um we had this project of having a kitchen truck um and uh so we had a cook who kind of had to always negotiate in the kitchens and and you know at the hotels didn't like that but we wanted that our cook cooked the riders meals that makes sense yeah um, so we wanted to take it to the next level and have a truck uh where our cook would cook and also where the riders would eat so it would be like a mobile restaurant for the nine riders not for the staff just for the nine riders so that got you know stopped by uh, aso also, uh, mm. we, it, we were not allowed to do it because, uh, I mean, it, officially they said, yeah, you know, there's already so many vehicles and whenever you're with three or four other teams in the same hotel, it will, it, there's not enough parking space. There's never enough <laughs> parking space. So mm. we were not allowed to do it. Uh, now every, every big team have those. They yeah. all do. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's typical. It's the power. Okay. We have the power and you need to do what we tell you to do, you know, had, you need to, had it been their decision to, you need to you can do this. It would have been very different. Stay in the hotel that, you know, for, for example, one of the things is if they all, they just, the use, the, the ASO decides which hotels you will stay in. And, the, you know, there's this system, which is kind of fair, you know, like over the course of the three weeks, every team gets this, you know, overall the same kind of treatments in terms of stars. You know, it can be in a five-star hotel, for two days, but then three days later, you're going to be in a two-star hotel. And so they tried to be fair and equal to all the teams. Oh, and, the, you, and you've talked course. about it in the past. Sometimes yeah. you're, you're but hotel. If you're, for example, if you're in a small hotel and, it, and and you see that the kitchen is a mess and, you know, there's no AC and the beds are terrible, mm. you are not allowed to choose another hotel. I mean, you could, in theory, say, okay, you know what, we'll go 50, 50 kilometers away, but I want to put my riders, at least my riders in a proper decent hotel where wow. I know that they're going to have a good night's sleep. Uh, it's not allowed. Uh, wow. You have to stay. So, you know, no. And you've said in the past, sometimes it's the hotels 30 minutes from the finish. Sometimes it's two and a half hours. No, I heard, <laughs> I listened uh, today, today, uh, 
Cavendish said in the interview that they woke up at 6.30 this morning and they had like a almost a 200 kilometer transfer to the start of the of the of the stage oh geez before, yeah and then 230 kilometers on the bike uh i mean these are the things that obviously we don't see but the yeah. logistics there is a lot going on but anyways the van is not uh allowed to be at the race uh so anyways Visma okay. doesn't care. They, they they'll do whatever they have to do it doesn't really matter it's okay. just more publicity for them all right. Here is uh, your Ventum trivia. We're giving away a brand new NS1 road bike from Ventum at the end of this tour. Uh, every day you can log on and enter. Take your time. Look up the answers and uh, enter every day if you like. And that will increase your chances to win. Yesterday's question is, what is the name of the Tour de France's lion mascot? That answer is Leo. Leo the lion. Didn't know that. Leo. I didn't uh, know that <laughs> there are two correct answers to the next one. I'm, I bet you know this, Johan. Which Italian cyclist won the most Tour de France stages and how many? There are two correct hmm. answers. The Stu. Mm -hmm. well, a, a recent one? I mean, an, an, one from your era and one from uh, farther in the past. Further in the, okay. Yeah, much further in the past. Yeah, I think I, think I know the one from yeah. my era. I think you do too. <laughs> yeah, I think you do too. But uh, send in your answer, ventumracing.com slash the move. All right, ventumracing.com slash the move. Submit it. Don't email us. A lot of people are emailing in their answers. S submit it online. Uh, and one more, we're running a little bit longer than we thought. One more quick question here for you, Johan, from Mike. Uh, he says, was Johan ever on a tour winning team as a rider? And if not, was there a year when you were very close? Mm -hmm. uh, did he have good directors when he was a writer that he learned a lot from? That's Mike in Cottonwood, California. Mm -hmm. um, the answer is I was never on a team that won the tour as a cyclist. Um, I was on a team that tried to win the tour uh, one year. Uh, we didn't win, but we got second, fourth, and sixth. Mm. Which and team was that? Uh, Onse. Onse. Say. So it was Miguel Indurain's last Tour de France in 95. Uh, Alex Zula was second. Um, Laurent Jalabert was fourth and won the green jersey. And Melchor Maury was sixth. Um, we won, I think, three stages. Uh, I, I won a stage, got the yellow jersey, and we won the team's classification. Yeah. Pretty good year. Pretty good that year. That's a good year. Yeah. And how about uh, the other part of this question? Did you have good directors that uh, you learned a lot from as a writer? I learned from every single director. Um, sometimes, you know, the good things, sometimes things that I didn't agree with. But um, I, I, I would say, yeah, I had good directors. Um, never, you know, never really had any issues with, uh, with any directors. And, uh, I, you know, I learned a lot from every single one of them. And then I tried to combine everything I learned from all the different ones and put it together. So that's, that's kind of true of every career, isn't it? You, just, you yeah. kind of just learn from it. Is there one thing that really stands out to you that, that you remember who you learned from and what it was? Um, I, I'd have to say, you know, I learned the most from uh, my director at Onse, Manolo Saiz. He was um, an atypical director uh in the sense that he had never been a professional cyclist he had been a cyclist but never a good cyclist uh but he was very special in his forward thinking uh he, he always came with new ideas uh very innovative in terms of equipment we had we had we had always the most advanced equipment um and also i mean sometimes tactically was not the best decisions, but especially in terms of teamwork and what the team means. And the team comes first before every single individual. Um, Which I is probably that. one of the hardest things to manage yes. as a director. Yes, it, yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> right? and, and, and I have to say, I learned a lot from him in that, in that sense. Okay. Well, great. I'll hold on to this other question for tomorrow. But if you have a question for a future show, send it to the move at we do dot team. Uh, thanks for tuning in to JB Squared. Johan, thanks for your insight as always. And everyone, we appreciate you listening to this show. Okay, JB. Thanks. And thanks everybody for listening and watching. <laughs>